Bonsoir à tous. C'est un plaisir de, de vous voir aujourd'hui. Je suis Normand Mousseau, je me présente. Je suis le directeur académique de l'Institut de l'énergie Trottier. C'est un institut qui a été créé il y a quelques années, dans le mandat est d'accompagner la transition énergétique à la fois par l'enseignement, par la recherche, puis aussi la communication. Et aujourd'hui, la communication grand public, c'est entre autres le mandat du symposium. Aujourd'hui, qui est organisé en collaboration avec euh, TAIZ, l'Institut Trottier euh, sur le développement durable euh, de l'Université McGill. Alors, c'est le quatrième symposium annuel Trottier sur l'ingénierie, l'énergie et la conception durable. Euh, cette année, on, a, on parle transport, transport durable, donc à quoi carbure la transition dans le transport. Et euh, vous êtes d'abord, je voudrais vous remercier encore parce que vous avez vu qu'on a fait des efforts pour améliorer, pour lier transport et santé en fermant la rampe en bas, donc en vous forçant à, à venir à pied. Et donc, euh, on travaille très fort pour euh, s'assurer que tout le monde euh, améliore sa santé. Et euh, ce n'est pas tout, c'est aussi une première cette année, puisque euh, le symposium est rediffusé aujourd'hui et demain en direct sur la chaîne YouTube de Polytechnique. Donc, euh, voilà. Euh, ce soir, les présentations euh, seront en anglais. Euh, pour notre auditoire francophone qui le veut, un service de traduction simultané vous est offert, disponible. Donc, vous pouvez passer à l'arrière, euh, à l'extérieur, pour aller chercher euh, vos écouteurs. Et euh, nous allons prendre donc les questions après la deuxième présentation. Il y aura donc deux présentations. Puis, on prendra des questions du public et également de l'auditoire en ligne. Donc, si vous avez des questions en ligne, n'hésitez pas, on va vous le rappeler tout à l'heure et vous avez qu'à nous les envoyer et quelqu'un se chargera de nous les faire parvenir jusqu'à l'avant. Alors, nous sommes vraiment très heureux d'accueillir ce soir des experts, ce soir et demain. Donc, on a deux soirées. Ce soir, comme je l'ai dit, ça va se passer en anglais. Demain, ça sera en français. Et ce soir, pour piloter la soirée, euh, je suis très heureux de dire que nous, euh, nous avons l'honneur de d'avoir de Catherine Morancy, qui est une des grandes spécialistes du transport en mobilité, en fait, euh, au Québec. Alors, qui va euh, animer euh, cette soirée? Catherine. Merci. <rire> je ne sais pas si on peut se permettre des blagues, on anime quelque chose de sérieux, mais pour tous les étudiants à qui je ne réponds pas par courriel, c'est que je suis occupée ce soir. Donc, merci. Euh, en fait, <rire> je m'excuse. Un peu de sérieux quand même. Donc, en fait, je vais commencer immédiatement parce que mon rôle d'animatrice, c'est simplement d'inviter nos conférenciers qui ont bien voulu nous joindre pour nous parler, de nous faire partager leurs connaissances. Donc, je vais inviter M. Peter Norton, professeur à l'Université de Virginie. Donc, quelques mots sur, sur ce que M. Peter Norton fait. Donc, il est professeur agrégé d'histoire au département de génie et de société de l'Université de Virginie. Il est l'auteur du livre « Fighting Traffic, the Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City ». Son article « Street Rivals, Jaywalking and the Invention of the Motor Age Street » a gagné le prix d'Abbott Payson Usher de l'organisation Society for the History of Technology. Il a publié des travaux sur l'histoire et la politique des transports, de même que sur la sécurité routière et sur les véhicules autonomes, qui est un sujet très, très à la mode. Il est membre du University of Virginia Center for Transportation Studies et il a remporté le prix d'enseignement Hartfield Jefferson Scholars et le prix Hutchinson décerné par Trigon Engineering Society pour son dévouement et son excellence dans l'enseignement. Donc, M. Norton, je vous invite à monter sur la scène pour faire votre conférence. Merci beaucoup. Uh, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être à Québec et d'essayer de parler un peu de français que j'ai étudié à l'école il y a 30 ans. Et c'est rare que j'ai l'opportunité d'essayer de parler en français. Je suis très, très reconnaissante à l'Institut de l'énergie Trottier, à M. Trottier, à, à, à les très gentils hommes qui m'aidaient, comme euh, Louis Baumier, et comme uh, uh, Audrey Rondeau et des autres aussi. And now I will speak in English. <laughs> Merci. Technology innovation can offer us new choices and new means to pursue them. 
but it can't tell us what to pursue. Yet, strangely, we find technology offered as an answer in itself so often. The high-tech solutions are always data-driven, as if we don't have to ask humans what data we need or what the data tell us. To ask such questions does not make you a Luddite. It means that you appreciate what technology really has to offer, which is new ways to pursue goals chosen by humans ourselves. It's to recognize that we have spectrums of choices, a spectrum from high tech to low tech and even to no tech. It's to to contend that we need access to the full range of that spectrum if we are to find the answers that we seek. And in expecting access to that full spectrum of choices, it's to also to recognize that the end we seek is not autonomous systems, but autonomous humans. We should have learned this long ago. Uh, North Americans learned generations ago uh, when we were sold a utopian future, a utopian vision of a future of freedom delivered by technology. It was an elusive future where we would someday be able to drive everywhere alone without delay at any time and park for free when we got there. That was the future we were sold. That was the future we bought. It's not a future you can have, but we are still pursuing it. Uh, I uh, propose to you that we have a history to learn over again. The people who sold us that vision of the future also sold us a justification for that future they embedded it in a historical trajectory that justified it. It's a misleading history that was written for us to convince us that the Drive Anywhere city was the city we North Americans always wanted. We hear today that technology can offer us success at finally achieving the Drive Anywhere city as if the problem has been the technology and not human choices. I suggest to you that we have lost a history, not by accident, that offers to return to us the full spectrum of choices, including high tech, including low tech, and including no tech, that can finally give us a future of our own choosing. I took this photograph about a half mile from where I live, and you'll notice the sign of Harding's Auto Sales it says, nobody walks. <laughs> this is the cost of the pursuit of the drive anywhere city. It's not so much that nobody walks because there are no conditions under which people might possibly want to walk, but as you can see from this picture, nobody walks because this is a world made for anybody but walkers. And it is a world uh, that, that is the side effect of the pursuit of this strange utopia. Our teachers tonight include Rachel Carson, who I think many of you will recognize. Maybe some of you also recognize Charles Kettering of General Motors. Both of them actually corroborate, I think, what I have to offer to you tonight in quite different ways. This is the Katy Expressway outside Houston. It's Interstate 10 in Texas. This is what you get when you try to pursue the drive anywhere at any time without delay future. And they're not done yet. This is the Texas Transportation Institute's urban mobility scorecard, which says we're still not doing enough. The Katy Expressway is only the start. I wonder what this strange utopia will look like when we finally arrive at it 
if indeed we ever do. It equates all delay to drivers as bad transportation. It's not alone. This is the American Society for Civil Engineers urban or infrastructure report card where uh, U.S. infrastructure always gets a D average forever, no matter how many billions we spend on it, roads get a D. This is evidently then not enough. This leads me to this quotation from 1962, future historians may well be amazed by our distorted sense of proportion. And I as a historian can confirm that I am indeed amazed by this distorted sense of proportion. But this statement was not written by somebody about transportation. This is Rachel Carson talking about the overuse of pesticides like DDT in Silent Spring. So I'm trying to suggest to you that the same kind of mentality that led people to try to exterminate, literally try to exterminate insect pests, so-called, at the peril of a future with no songbirds, is the same mentality we have still not overcome that is trying to build a future of no delay car dependent transportation, which I think is as mad as no insect pests in the future would be. Rachel Carson proposed balance, and we need something very much like that in transportation. Rachel Carson, and this is again directly from Silent Spring, said the chemical war is never won about trying to kill off all insects. Well, of course, the traffic war is never won either. It's never won, but there are losers like pedestrians. For example, this pair trying to cross a street in Georgia. They are losers in the traffic war that is never won. Wars that are unwinnable were, of course, a source of concern uh, for a long time. Even before Silent Spring, President Eisenhower warned, of course, in his famous farewell address in January 1961, that the unwinnable waging of the Cold War was actually creating a kind of winner in the form of the military industrial complex, which of course won every day during the Cold War. The winners of the chemical war included the manufacturers of DDT. The winners in the war on pain, another unwinnable war, include Purdue Pharma, which offered unfulfillable promises to create a market that will never be satiated because it creates more demand with all the demand that it serves with OxyContin. So we see this too in particularly the US's urban transportation and surface transportation systems. The American Highway Users Conference will never have enough highways. The American Society of Civil Engineers will never have enough highways, though they have a prescription for you in the form of, or for us in the States, of $3.6 trillion by 2020. If you think that will solve the problem, you have something to learn from history. Something to learn from Charles Kettering, who was actually quite astute about how you can win this kind of thing, at least for those who are waging the war. In 1929, Charles Kettering of General Motors wrote in Nation's Business Magazine an article called Keep the Consumer Dissatisfied. And we've been dissatisfied ever since. We cannot satisfy the consumer or we will lose a market. An unsatisfied consumer will buy more. You can see this in the invention of bad breath or halitosis, which warns you that you can never win in the war against bad breath. You have to use mouthwash every day. And of course, millions agreed. It's in also General Motors' ladder of success, whereby a Chevrolet was not going to satisfy you for long because you could get a Pontiac next or an Oldsmobile after that and a Buick and finally, uh, of course, a Cadillac. You look, if you look back at the history we've lost, and you can see a, a couple of examples of this from Montreal, you can see a city where people shared space, where pedestrians had a right to the street, where their rights were upheld, where people did not have to go very far, and therefore walking was practical. And even if they did have to go far, they had some choices, like, for example, this streetcar. Now, of course, mixing automobiles with this was dangerous as you can see in these cartoons from the 1920s. By 1923, already 15,000 Americans, US Americans were killed 
by automobiles. In cities, those were mostly pedestrians and children. But at the time, the blame was on the driver and on the car, not on the pedestrian. We had, as you can see, proposals for ordinances like a mechanical speed governor being required such that you could not go faster than 25 miles an hour. This scared people who wanted a future for automobiles in cities. They organized and called themselves motordom and fought back with ads like this, urging people to vote no on this speed governor ordinance on the grounds that it would set Cincinnati back. There were similar proposals in other cities as well. All of these proposals have been quite forgotten. The motordom interest groups allied to fight back and to redefine what safety meant. They didn't want safety to mean restricting automobiles. They wanted it to mean restricting pedestrians. You can see that program appearing in 1922 in the Engineering News Record, a journal of the civil engineering profession, where the author writes, the obvious solution lies only in a radical revision of our conception of what a city street is for. This is a battle cry to redefine streets as places for automobiles. Uh, and it's on paper and clear by 1922. To redefine them, you have to ridicule old street uses, like jaywalking, which was invented and propagated in this year, era. You had to teach children that the street is for autos, as this uh, coloring book is telling you. Imagination wasn't as celebrated in 1925 as it is today. You were supposed to follow the model at the top as you colored in the bottom. And every time your eyes as a child passed from the top picture to the bottom picture, your eyes passed over these words, the street is for autos. A new generation was growing up believing this. There were many other techniques as well, but I give you a couple of useful illustrations, I think. There's a man who opened my eyes to this technique, and particularly to the importance of the history we've, in, we've inherited and the importance of questioning it. That man was Carter Woodson. Carter Woodson was a historian. He was the founder of the Journal of Negro History. He was the man who started Negro History Week, which evolved into Black History Month. And if you want to know why a man who was motivated primarily by a quest for a future of social justice and racial harmony and an end to white supremacy. Why would a man so interested in the future be a historian? It's because he viewed the primary obstacle to such a future as the history that they had inherited at that time. He wanted to change the future and that meant changing the past. And in his case, it meant correcting the past. This is the future Motordom wanted for us. You'll recognize this still or this photo from General Motors' Futurama exhibit at the New York World's Fair of 1939. Uh, none of these cars had to park. They actually moved on little slots, but they just went round and round on the road forever. And therefore, this future utopia was apparently possible because none of these cars had to park. It was, in effect, a yellow brick road, like the same year of the movie, The Wizard of Oz, only they're going now to the General Motors exhibit, but it's still 1939. Notice the yellow brick road leaning into the General Motors exhibit. Charles Kettering recognized, like Carter Woodson did, the importance of history. That's why he wrote the first popular history of the automobile with another GM associate named Alan Orth. They wrote a history of the automobile in the USA called The New Necessity. The title speaks for itself. In the 1940s and 50s, they took the show on the road with an amazing electromechanical model that showed over the course of 10 minutes with an audio narration, the transformation of a small town from an isolated backwater into a thriving metropolis, all due to the automobile. This was the history of the automobile told for millions of Americans in a way that justified the pursuit of the drive anywhere city. This story was told again in 1961 by the DuPont show of the week. At that time, DuPont owned a 23% share of General Motors. And Groucho Marx hosted a program, a one-hour program, about the history of the car in the USA. And that history of cars message was that Americans have a love affair with the automobile. And if, that was an ingenious approach to take, because love is not to be questioned by nosy experts. In a free society, love is blind, and people should pursue it wherever they want. 
And this sort of bypassed the abundant expert criticism of the automobile that was very common at the time. That story has not gone away. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, you'll find the largest exhibit in the National Museum of American History, a taxpayer-supported museum, uh, a large exhibit called America on the Move. If you need to know where it is, you'll find it in the General Motors Hall of Transportation. And this exhibit tells you that Americans became a car-dependent society, not their term, of course, because it was the free choice of a free people. That's uh, a simplification, but I think a fair one, of the message. The pursuit of this was very different from the utopian promise. This is Hastings Street in Detroit in 1955. This is where I-75, the Chrysler Freeway, would go through a few years later, and it did this to that neighborhood. I'll put them side by side for you. That is the same perspective. Uh, this is what happens when you try to pursue a zero delay, drive anywhere future. This is what you get. Of course, you don't just get this because all the cars that are about to go on that highway, it's brand new here and not yet trafficked, all of those cars will have to park somewhere. Consider what this does to a city. This is Detroit and all of the Orange areas are where parking garages are, and all the pink areas are where surface parking lots are. All those cars have to park somewhere, right? So in effect, I think it's fair to say you have to destroy a city to make it a city where everybody can drive anytime without delay and park when they get there. And of course, even with delay uh, when they get there. Now, these traffic problems have been recognized for a long time. There's nothing new about our discussions in general. It's the details that have changed. Even the high-tech answers that are favored today have a long history. This photograph or this uh, magazine story is from the 50s, and it shows us the crash-proof highways of the future due to autonomous cars. Notice that this is a city with nobody on foot and almost without any buildings either. That, that future has persisted. Now we're up to 1970, and there's still this vision of a future city where people can't walk anywhere, but they can sure drive wherever they want to go in comfort. And of course, we see that today. This is MIT's drive wave system, which claims it's a, about an autonomous intersection. The autonomy, of course, is of the system, not of the driver who loses autonomy as a result of this. It also promises both benefits in traffic flow and in emissions without noting that, of course, both will be diminished, if not negated, by the highly predictable traffic effects of accelerating traffic so much. Of course, if you eliminate delay, people simply move out further. This is Economics 101, which is why I think I, I can report that. This is uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers is promising the same thing for a fee as is the American Highway Users Alliance. The consultancy, KPMG, is reassuring today the automobile industry, which used to call itself motordom, and I think it's still a useful term because it's more comprehensive in character. Uh, KPMG is advising the U.S. automobile industry today about how they can win the transition to autonomous vehicles. And they're very optimistic that it can be done. The solution will be to preserve the single owner model as opposed to the shared model. They have specific proposals for how they can do it. And they're even convinced that they can actually sell more cars if Detroit will follow KPMG's advice. They promise ecstatically, even to the point of using exclamation points in their copy, that they can get average occupancy of motor vehicles on US roads down below one, because of course there'll be some empty cars running around to find parking places or to pick you up. So if the promise of KPMG is that the autonomous car future can be a winner for motordom if they play their cards right. Well, motordom has been playing its cards superbly well ever since they defeated that Cincinnati traffic proposal that would have limited cars mechanically to a maximum speed of 25 miles an hour. And yet, it seems to me it's still quite rare that we recognize the extent to which this debate is being influenced 
uh, by the people with the biggest material interest in it, uh, motordom, right? They offer a reassurance to the automobile industry in this report that consumers want one trillion miles of more mobility. I cringe when I read this because motordom figured out a long time ago that it can tell people what they want and they'll get somewhere with such claims. They've been telling people that we wanted the drive anywhere, drive alone city. That's what Charles Kettering was telling Americans back in 1932 in that book, The New Necessity, which was the first significant popular history of the automobile in the United States. They're still telling that. The histories of the automobile that we follow in North America are profoundly influenced by the message that says that we North Americans are uniquely culturally attracted to automobiles and willing to destroy our cities for the benefit of our automobility. We've been telling, we've been, a motor demand has been telling us what we want and we have been believing them. Now the movie, The Wizard of Oz, omits something very important that's in the book. It's not a spoiler because it's a small part in the book, in case you haven't read the book, which is quite wonderful, 1901, The Wizard of Oz. It turns out that the Emerald City looks like it's made of emeralds because Dorothy and even Toto have to wear green glasses. And the green glasses make this white plaster sham city look glorious. And the message is, watch out for the, those who are misleading you, whether it's the Wizard of Oz or Motordom. I say that today we need a Rachel Carson who can tell us about the future we're heading to if we stay on the path that we've been on. A future that frankly we've already arrived at. That's the future where we have signs like in my town on a local street that say approximately correctly, nobody walks. So Rachel Carson warned us in 1962 of a silent spring that is a future with no songbirds. We need a warning about the future we have in store for us and a future we're already largely arrived at where we have no walking. Thank you very much. It's the slow walk. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, I don't know if I have to say thank you, but I will say thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit in shock, though I knew what you were uh, about to say. So what I could say, what more do we need to take action, if it's so obvious, but we will have a discussion after. I will just say that I'm a civil engineer, and this is not my view. Well, that's okay, not the end one, but the first one you presented. Okay, so now we're gonna move to the second one, but keep your question, I'm sure you have plenty, or you're either in shock, but they will come. So. So I will present the next, uh, je vais parler en français, je m'excuse. <laughs> Donc maintenant, je vais passer, passer à Monsieur uh, Anthony Pearl. Donc, merci encore. Uh, donc, il est professeur à l'Université Simon Fraser à Vancouver. Donc, il est professeur d'études urbaines et de sciences politiques à Simon Fraser University à Vancouver. Il a étudié en administration et en sciences politiques. Donc, au-delà des frontières disciplinaires et nationales, ses recherches explorent les décisions politiques liées au transport, aux villes et à l'environnement. Il a publié dans des dizaines de revues académiques. Il a reçu plusieurs distinctions pour des articles exceptionnels, notamment à la World Conference on Transportation Research et auprès du groupe de recherche sur les transports au Canada. Il co-signe également plusieurs livres, et je vais en nommer un, notamment « Transport Revolutions, Moving People and Freight Without Oil ». Et euh, il a conseillé des gouvernements en Australie, en Belgique, au Canada, en France et aux États-Unis sur la recherche et l'élaboration de politiques en matière de transport et d'environnement. Et il est membre de la Commission de planification urbaine de Vancouver. Donc, M. Pearl, je vous invite... Euh, à prendre la parole. Merci. Merci et uh, bonsoir à tous. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, inviting me to join you tonight to uh, talk about um, post-carbon mobility transitions. Um, And I'm going to focus on our uh, three largest cities uh, here in, uh, in Canada, 
I think we've heard an excellent overview of uh, some of the challenges uh, we face uh, in uh, moving uh, beyond uh, auto dependence. Um, but I would like to uh, suggest that uh, there is uh, uh, some hope, and uh, that hope um, uh, needs uh, uh, us to look uh, uh, into our uh, big cities in Canada because um, in addition to all the other challenges that uh, motordom uh, presents to us, um, it also um, today and uh, for I think the uh, medium term future at least uh, is an oil dependent and therefore uh, climate and energy vulnerable uh, mode of mobility. Um, and as you can see, uh, international uh, energy agency statistics remind us that uh, this is uh, uh, the vast majority of the world's mobility is powered by uh, oil. And as uh, we don't have time now, but uh, I'm sure most of you uh, can uh, understand and uh, uh, have a clear picture, that brings lots of vulnerability uh, with it um, for climate and energy futures. So I would like to uh, suggest that uh, where we are tonight, plus Toronto and Vancouver, are uh, Canada's uh, best uh, hope for uh, weathering the vulnerability and uh, that uh, post-carbon energy transition in mobility. Um, to do that, our uh, adaptation is going to uh, require using a lot less carbon-based uh, energy sources. Um, at, at least 50% uh, less and probably closer to 80% uh, less than our current consumption levels. And that uh, uh, challenge, I think, um, requires uh, a rapid shift, uh, an increase in mobility uh, powered by uh, electric uh, energy oh. sources. Um, again, these are uh, topics that many of you in the room are much more uh, experienced and expert than I. But I think that uh, as uh, a reminder and also a sort of a macro focus, we can uh, take a minute to think that electric uh, mobility um, offers a path toward incremental sustainable resilience uh, in our future uh, because it allows us, at least in the mobility sector, it's the only path forward that allows us to adapt um, and increase uh, non-carbon sources, post-carbon uh, renewable uh, energy sources into the energy mix that powers our mobility one step at a time. The uh, motors that run electric uh, mobility don't really care where the electrons come from. Um, they can be mixed. They can come from solar, wind, uh, hydro, as we all know in Canada already very well, uh, tidal, geothermal, uh, and someday maybe one of you will uh, invent cold fusion. It really doesn't matter where the uh, electrons come from and whether they come from different places. Once they get into the electric grid, they can replace the non-renewable inputs one plant at a time. And uh, each time we advance our capacity to generate renewable uh, electric energy, we can um, work uh, our way back from the carbon-based and also the nuclear uh, energy sources over time, which are less sustainable. So electricity is the uh, uh, carrier that allows us to have this adaptive change toward a resilient and sustainable future in our mobility system in ways that biofuels, hydrogen, and other uh, uh, sort of um, presented cures do not. You cannot uh, mix uh, hydrogen and biofuels in the same infrastructure of energy delivery and propulsion the way you can mix those same uh, energy sources in an electric grid and electric motors. So that's why um, electric mobility um, has to have a high priority in our future. And in Canada, uh, in the three largest cities, as well as in many other big cities uh, in the world, we have uh, a lot of capacity already uh, in the form of grid-connected vehicles. These are Canadian uh, illustrations, a couple of, one of which is very familiar to you uh, here in Montreal with your metro. Um, uh, another uh, image is of uh, our rapid transit in Vancouver, uh, the SkyTrain. 
And of course, uh, we have uh, electric uh, trolley buses uh, in Vancouver that work very well. These are mature, off-the-shelf technologies, which is not to say that they're old-fashioned. They're continually being improved and uh, made more efficient and uh, cost-effective. Uh, but we have this backbone in our uh, three big cities, as well as a few other uh, cities in Canada. Um, it's in these three cities where electric mobility already carries a majority of the mobility on public uh, transport in, in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Let's take just a, a quick uh, overview. Uh, some of you will uh, be more familiar with uh, some of these uh, than I am. For example, most of you are much more familiar with uh, Montreal's uh, uh, electric mobility backbone, the metro uh, system here. Uh, it is, uh, at, by one measure, the most successful uh, in Canada because the uh, metro carries the highest modal share um, of uh, mobility uh, on public transit in this uh, uh, electric uh, system here. Uh, the size of the uh, city and the region are probably well known to you, as is when the metro uh, opened, although we'll get back to that date. Uh, uh, unlike uh, Professor Norton, and I practice history without training, but so we will have some history uh, uh, here uh, from the 1960s. And uh, the scale of the system, again, is quite familiar uh, to you. Maybe you're also uh, familiar with uh, your next uh, big city neighbor uh, to the uh, uh, west, Toronto. Um, Toronto launched uh, rapid transit, by which I mean a separate guideway, higher speed, higher volume uh, capacity uh, uh, electric uh, mobility in Canada. Um, but it's not kept up with uh, the growth of the city's population and mobility. As uh, most people know, Toronto is even more uh, congested than some of those uh, uh, D minus uh, report cards that are given out uh, for American uh, uh, road infrastructure uh, in, in the US. I moved to Canada to uh, do my uh, doctorate uh, in uh, transport policy at the University of Toronto in 1984. And uh, the metro map there at that time was almost identical. The only uh, thing that's been added since I arrived uh, is the purple line up at uh, the top. So Toronto has grown a lot uh, since then, uh, but the uh, rapid transit uh, has not. And again, there, and it's also the only one uh, in uh, Canada where the rapid transit infrastructure currently, this will change a little bit when they extend it a little further, currently stops at the city limits. It does not cross any municipal boundary in Toronto, and that uh, will tell you something later on uh, in the story as well. Meanwhile, Vancouver, my current home, it's not why I live there, but uh, uh, is Canada's leader in uh, uh, electric uh, mobility. We have the longest uh, rapid transit uh, infrastructure uh, in the country. We've done it by uh, going slowly but steadily. One uh, line has been added per decade. The Expo line added in the 1980s for our Expo. The Millennium Line added in the 1990s in time for the Millennium. The Canada Line paid for with a big check from uh, Ottawa in part, which bought the name Canada Line in time for the 2010 uh, Olympics. And the Evergreen Line just recently uh, added uh, last December. So we've been slow but steady. And uh, if you would have asked me when I moved to Canada in 1984, then in uh, 2017, which city would have the biggest rapid transit system uh, in the country, I wouldn't have picked uh, Vancouver. And if you would have asked me which um, city in the country would have been the first to connect its airport to its rail transit system, I wouldn't have picked uh, Vancouver. But I think there's some lessons um, in that sort of strategy that uh, got us uh, uh, to this place uh, where Vancouver is uh, ahead of much bigger cities um, like uh, Montreal and Toronto. So we need to, at least uh, with two colleagues, Matt Hearn and uh, Jeff Kenworthy, we're writing a, uh, a book that tries to add up the 20th century uh, recipe and uh, lessons from investing in what we call major mobility infrastructure, both the expressways and the rapid transit corridors uh, in our three biggest uh, cities. 
and try to ask the questions, what does it tell us? What does it reveal uh, to us when we see these uh, results? How much was spent, what it bought, and how it was assembled, the capital, the significant capital for these major pieces of infrastructure. I think what I will uh, be able to at least touch on tonight is to give you a sense that Montreal and Vancouver have a lot in common uh, with each other in terms of their strategy and the way in which they've approached major mobility infrastructure development, including this electric mobility backbone, which offers one uh, insurance option for our uh, uh, sustainable and resilient uh, future. Um, whether this was fully intentional or whether it reflects larger structural factors about the way in which Canadian cities relate to the global uh, economy, it would be a question for a, another symposium, another institute perhaps, but um, we, we followed very much the same uh, playbook as you will uh, see. Meanwhile, Toronto is the outlier. We all know that Toronto is kind of a world unto itself, um, and uh, they created uh, their own very much made in Toronto uh, major mobility infrastructure policy, which um, is uh, quite uh, unique and striking in some ways, but again gives us some essential Canadian content and characteristics to think about when we think about how we would sort of build on this, this backbone that we've got and take it forward to the kinds of greater and more extensive electric mobility future that I think Canada is going to need in its urban areas at least and probably in its regions of, of everything beyond the sort of rural and remote uh, sections over time. Well, putting my urban studies uh, lens on to sort of delve into these questions, there's a lot of work that's been done about global cities research. What are cities sort of place in the global pecking order and their aspirations and their approach to uh, both physical, social, and economic activities that are related to that. And there's all sorts of classifications, uh, uh, the simplest of which is trying to identify which cities in the world have the most uh, globally uh, interconnected and intense uh, economic, social, uh, and cultural activities. Um, on the economic side, it's the so-called fire, uh, finance, uh, investment, and real estate uh, that are the key indicators of global intensity in a city. And in the post-war period, the one that Professor Norton was uh, discussing uh, uh, before, um, Montreal was Canada's alpha city in this sort of uh, apogee of motordom. Uh, uh, but um, it approached it a little bit uh, differently, but just to uh, put the uh, evidence before you first, it was Canada's financial center up through the 1960s. It had the most corporate headquarters in Canada through the 1960s. Canada's only UN uh, uh, agency, UN level agency is headquartered here in Montreal. I noticed, maybe I just missed it uh, in previous trips, but last night when I was on the metro, they even added the uh, name of the agency to a metro stop. I don't know if that was recent, uh, whether there was any particular um, meaning behind that or whether they just finally thought, well, we'll put these uh, letters in there or not. But it's significant that uh, this made, um, and, and also uh, uh, in terms of trade and travel, the statistics, if you look at uh, air and sea, um, uh, uh, transport volumes, both of freight and people, through the 1960s, Montreal was the uh, global gateway to Canada. What did that mean? for a city uh, and its major mobility uh, strategy. Well, it gave Montreal global aspirations that were on a different scale from uh, the rest of uh, Canada. And uh, in, uh, at the municipal level, uh, one of the gentlemen, I guess on your uh, right uh, there, Mayor Jean Drapeau, um, understood or discovered that uh, mega events would be a way to leverage the uh, investments that would be needed to get that major infrastructure that a global city, an alpha city like Montreal needed, deserved, and would keep uh, its place in the uh, global uh, universe out there. So of course you know the story of Expo 67, probably better than me, but from a, a major mobility infrastructure side, once uh, the city was committed, once Canada was committed to the uh, Expo, all of a sudden, governments, uh, municipal, 
and provincial and federal were committed to various investments that made the uh, first wave of uh, this major mobility infrastructure, both the metro and some expressways, we'll get to those in a minute, um, happen. And this is uh, a quote from uh, Mayor Drapeau on the uh, opening day of the, and a picture on, on the opening day of the uh, metro in 1966, just ahead of the uh, expo. Note his uh, focus on how this type of infrastructure is making Montreal a city that is open to the whole wide world. I don't think that's coincidental. Globalism and globalization and urbanism running together in Canada's um, infrastructure development in Montreal. And of course, it wasn't just about uh, metros either. Uh, another big uh, engineering achievement, quite significant, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pont Tunnel uh, La Fontaine uh, was opened also uh, at that time. And you've got uh, the infamous uh, Turcotte uh, uh, Expressway uh, Exchange as well, which is built up uh, uh, quite impressively uh, in that period as well. Well, what happened? Expo was uh, a great success. Montreal got a huge boost in terms of its mobility infrastructure, and uh, the uh, mayor and others uh, uh, decided that uh, if some was good, more was better. So it was time to uh, double down and uh, have an even bigger mega event uh, to follow, the uh, 1976 uh, Olympics. Without going into all the details, more infrastructure, more leveraging of uh, capital, uh, mainly public capital for this. Um, and uh, I think during this period, from the 1960s through roughly the early 70s when these commitments are being made, Montreal offers Canada a, a clear example of locally initiated national urban policy. The federal government was, and, and uh, the province of Quebec were both sort of drawn in, sometimes voluntarily, uh, more than others, into this major investment uh, in infrastructure. Uh, that was initiated at the uh, urban scale. Uh, not all of this infrastructure brought uh, unalloyed un, uh, benefits. So there were people, uh, during the 1970s, um, there were many things that uh, Montrealers uh, debated uh, about uh, their future. But one thing, and the, the sometimes those debates divided across linguistic uh, lines, but one thing that both Anglophones and Francophones, I have the pictures to prove it here, um, could agree on was that uh, expressways in urban, built up urban areas, as was illustrated uh, in Detroit earlier, were not such a great thing, that they imposed very real costs on community. Uh, but what the lesson of the uh, global mega event strategy revealed is once you've signed the uh, bid uh, and got it awarded to have your Olympics uh, or your expo, that infrastructure is going to get built, whether you want it, whether everyone uh, agrees or not. So Montreal got a full build uh, expressway network, almost full, and a pretty extensive metro system uh, out of its global strategies during that period. Let's, uh, we're moving geographically, not uh, categorically, so we're gonna switch gears now and look briefly at Toronto, where rapid transit was launched in Canada in 1954. Now this poster tries to suggest that it's you know, got connections to the rest of the country, which it did, and even to the British Empire, which of course was big uh, in Toronto at the time. I also like the motto, transit progress is civic progress. I think that reveals more about what was actually going on behind this major investment. Imagine if a transit agency could actually build uh, a metro infrastructure or other form of rapid transit without asking for more taxes or grants from senior levels of government. We'd have a lot more of that infrastructure in Canada today. That's how Canada's first rapid transit, the young subway line, was built. During the 1940s and into the 50s, the Toronto Transit Commission actually generated a surplus. It took in more than it spent. And that accumulated surplus is what paid for Canada's first rapid transit uh, line. So at the local level, the, uh, an agency which had capacity that uh, we could only dream about today uh, uh, was able to launch Canada's uh, major mobility infrastructure in rapid transit, this first one. And in parallel, at the provincial level, 
The expressway uh, infrastructure, which was co-funded between the province and the municipal level, similar to uh, other places like Montreal, was being planned with a different set of goals and ideals uh, in mind, mainly regional development and trade and uh, logistics. The um, regional development and the uh, rapid transit development could coexist politically uh, because they didn't disrupt have permanent urban disruptions to the city. The first two major expressways in Toronto, the city of Toronto, the only ones that were ever fully completed as designed are the Gardner Expressway along the lakeshore and the Don Valley Parkway. These were built in um, natural environments that were not very populated. The, the picture on uh, your left is the Don Valley uh, Parkway being constructed along the ravine, natural environment. Of course, there are natural uh, capital impacts of this, but uh, the human impacts were low. And the uh, subway was a temporary disruption, and then uh, it was underground and less disruptive. So not too much opposition. But once the expressway plans got beyond natural uh, ravines and waterfronts and industrial lands where not too many people live, to build out the entire expressway plan, just as in Montreal, would involve com community disruption. Here you see artists' renditions, which are trying to make it uh, as nice looking as possible, of the Spadina Expressway, the famous expressway that was going to cut through the heart of uh, central Toronto down to the waterfront, going right by the University of Toronto right by Jane Jacobs' uh, neighborhood, uh, the Annex, um, creating a huge uh, trench of uh, four to six lanes uh, with uh, flyovers, et cetera. That would have had considerable disruption. And not surprisingly, just like in Montreal, it generated considerable protests uh, that were out from students, from faculty, uh, from uh, professionals who were in those days of the 19 late 60s, early 70s, already gentrifying these communities. Two prof economics professors at the uh, University of Toronto wrote uh, an expose called The Bad Trip, which I would recommend uh, sort of debunking some of the uh, benefits uh, of uh, the expressway. These um, efforts were quite effective at slowing down the construction and uh, also were backed with legal challenges that put the uh, project behind schedule and over budget. And when there was a change at the top in Ontario, a new premier, um, uh, William Davis, uh, came uh, to, uh, into office, he made an executive decision, top down, to cancel funding for urban expressway development. And Toronto represents the first and only to date example uh, in Canada where an express, urban expressway was canceled. I'll let you read his words. This was the speech he gave in the legislature to justify what he had done. Um, it's the only time that transit uh, infrastructure funding, more uh, rapid transit, was funded directly out of cancelled urban expressway funding. But after that, no more expressways were built uh, inside the boundaries of the city of Toronto. And after that also, for various reasons, uh, funding for rapid transit became harder to come by. Both expressways and suburbs kept growing outside the boundaries of the city. And one of the uh, Toronto Transit Commissioner uh, chief planners once described the result. He said, we're creating Vienna surrounded by Phoenix. Um, this was when I was in grad school uh, in the 1980s. And it was said without irony uh, initially at the time. It was almost said as a sense of achievement that this would be a great thing because you could have your cake and eat it too. Those who want to live in Vienna would live in the center and have the kind of lifestyle on the top. And those who wanted more space and more affordable housing would live in Phoenix and have that. Uh, but when you stop and think about it, the problem that was being created, what kind of uh, an infrastructure plan and uh, in, in investment cost would be needed to actually build out mobility that could connect Vienna and Phoenix together. You'd need all of the motor infrastructure and the rapid transit infrastructure to make it work. And those supply solutions have become very challenging so, uh, to uh, Toronto. So their, their struggle to this day is how to connect Vienna and Phoenix now that they've built out that, uh, that urban space. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, infrastructure investment went into uh, roads and uh, outside of urban areas. As you can see, it was roads to resources. 
There were still plans for urban expressway uh, infrastructure, um, especially to redevelop the uh, business uh, district in, uh, along Vancouver's waterfront. Nice uh, eight-lane waterfront uh, freeway there um, with lots of buildings, only one of which has been built, one of which looks suspiciously like Place Ville-Marie uh, over there. Um, but th those were the ideas how to duplicate that uh, on the Pacific. There was the usual uh, expected uh, uh, protests and disruptions. They were very passionate and colorful uh, along the way, but at the end of the day, it wasn't that the people in Vancouver were just more effective than the ones in Montreal who got uh, bulldozed and paved over. Um, it was that there wasn't the money. The province had put its money into expressway or highway infrastructure outside of urban areas for resource and natural uh, resource development and didn't see um, the benefits and payoff of uh, putting it into the downtown areas where no one would support them uh, anyway, uh, pretty much the same as to this day. Uh, the uh, support for the uh, sort of center and right governments uh, comes from the uh, surrounding areas, not the urban cores in Vancouver. But Vancouver did take some lessons from uh, Montreal um, after this, after the expressways were canceled and no more plans for them. It was time for our coming out party with Expo 86. And at that point, uh, the same approach of leveraging money from the federal government, from the provincial government for a global mega event uh, was done. And with another echo, we did it again for our Olympics. Remember the Canada? Line, uh, and how we got our train to the airport uh, long before Toronto and even longer before uh, Montreal. These were, by this point, electric uh, transit infrastructure inside the city, some expressways outside of the city. But the net result, Vancouver developed, um, some people call it Vancouverism, other people refer to it as Hongcouver. Um, what it is, is a high density, high quality uh, way of uh, urban life that is livable, which means walkable, um, which means that a car is an option, but uh, only optional inside the downtown and certain other transit nodes uh, in and around the metropolitan area, as opposed to the standard uh, motor dim uh, engineering uh, uh, space that would have had to be devoted only to uh, expressway infrastructure. And uh, as a result, in part, livability has become one of the biggest uh, engines of our economic activity in Vancouver and British Columbia. People have been buying into that from all over the world with all kinds of uh, resources. And as a side benefit, they have produced uh, the sort of political economy dynamics that allows even governments that are somewhat skeptical towards cities and uh, all the urban uh, uh, types in them who are uh, more progressive than average, let's say, uh, to still invest in electric rapid transit to keep Vancouver or Vancouverism uh, going uh, strong. So what are some of these implications from these different paths that our three biggest cities have uh, followed to produce this backbone of uh, electric uh, mobility? What does it mean for going forward with our urban mobility transitions, which are significant. I think we have the chance to build on what works and uh, what we've got. Um, I think that we can see that global city dynamics are very powerful catalysts in different generations, in different ends of the country. Um, usually tight-fisted um, politicians and bloodless bureaucrats open the vaults for uh, uh, major mobility infrastructure when they have a global mega event. Canadians uh, love to be well uh, appreciated and respected when others are around the world, when others are paying attention. So when, when we know the world is watching, we do the right thing in terms of investing, and sometimes the wrong thing too, but we invest anyway in our uh, major mobility infrastructure. These mega events then can be real catalysts. But um, we also uh, have a made in Canada solution in Toronto where if you get the prices right, and we could talk about that later too, um, the local, I mean, it's not just in Tokyo and Hong Kong where transit has actually been able to earn enough uh, surplus to be able to generate the investment to develop uh, that kind of uh, infrastructure. 
In all three cases, though, we see that when we've got this infrastructure embedding electric mobility into the core of our cities, we've got the opportunity for the post-carbon transitions that uh, we're going to be facing with increasing urgency in the years ahead. Thanks very much. So thank you, Mr. Pearl. It was very interesting, and I'm sure we will have a very uh, animated discussion now. So, uh, donc, nous allons passer à la période de questions. Peut-être que je pourrais d'abord, en fait, vous remercier encore. <laughs> thank you again. And I would like to invite you to join me uh, at the table so we can start the, uh, the discussion. So be prepared. You can ask your... <laughs> Préparez-vous. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en anglais ou en français. Il y a un service de traduction, donc euh, il y a des micros qui sont dans la salle. Vous pourrez euh, vous placer et attendre gentiment que je vous donne la parole. Je vais quand même... Euh, so, I will start with one question, when you are ready. I think you both have uh, one microphone. So, since I'm asking you a question, I will ask it in English first. Et ceux qui veulent poser des questions, je vous invite évidemment à prendre place euh, au micro. So I think one of the, uh, with both of your presentation, we, we are at the same time very sad. We're uh, hopeful at the same time. We can learn many things from what has been, uh, when, what has happened in the past. I'm sure you could have found some uh, very recent examples on expressways being built. So we still have some work to do. So let me ask one question. I think you can both provide some uh, very thoughtful answers. So what do you think, in, our, in your point of view, would be the most important lessons? So you both talked about some decisions that were made in the past. So what are the most important lessons we should apply in the upcoming transition? So we have, we're thinking about the transition. So I will give you both the, so maybe you can start. Uh, Mr. Well. Okay, um, lessons to, uh, to learn. Well, um, I think that we uh, uh, can see that the uh, uh, investment in major mobility infrastructure uh, that uh, came about in most of uh, urban Canada, most of the time, uh, was uh, resilient when it uh, uh, allowed for the uh, alternative to um, the sort of drive everywhere, uh, universal mobility through uh, auto dependence that was going on. In other words, Canada found a way, it was the only place uh, in North America that found a way to build significant amounts of uh, rapid transit. Uh, during this uh, period when um, uh, building infrastructure for the automobile was uh, the norm everywhere else. So 1954 Toronto and 1966 uh, Montreal uh, building major uh, mobility uh, into their uh, urban core. Um, that uh, investment uh, has uh, stood the test of time and uh, been able to um, be more open-ended to uh, uh, alternatives. We didn't put all of our mobility in one basket, in other words. We resisted that temptation, even though in Montreal there was uh, a basket that included plenty of uh, expressways. And in both Toronto and Vancouver, the basket of expressways continued outside of the, uh, the urban core. But it was not um, a monoculture. Uh, to take another ecological uh, uh, analogy, I think we've had a slightly more diverse mobility uh, culture. Even if that brings the contradictions of Vienna surrounded by Phoenix, at least it's not Phoenix surrounded by Phoenix. <laughs> I would um, add that uh, I think the lesson is best offered by the historian I referenced in my talk, Carter Woodson, whose associates were interested in the future and sometimes didn't realize how important the history they had in inherited was. The history that had been inherited that Woodson was concerned about was a history that had a lesson, and the lesson was that black Americans were unfit for full inclusion in a free society. And they had what they considered historical evidence to substantiate that contention. Well, needless to say, Woodson was skeptical, and he was confident that a fair review of the historical record 
from primary sources would reveal quite the opposite. And that's why he viewed history as the key to the real future alternatives. In other words, you can't know what the best future alternative will be until you understand the origins of your assumptions uh, that are governing your decisions. I think we are still living, even in 2017, in the grip of a lot of assumptions that are actually the products uh, as much of a historical effort to create a perpetual market for automobiles as they are in any kind of engineering analysis that we would recognize as scientific. Uh, we are dealing with assumptions that assume, for example, that all delay to a driver is a public responsibility that must be remediated with public expenditures in greater highway capacity. Um, we are still living in the daily grip of the assumption that you can somehow mitigate traffic congestion by supplying more underpriced capacity for drivers, a notion that would be laughable to uh, anybody in retail but that uh, is actually still a governing assumption accepted almost without question by the people who are planning our urban and uh, interstate highways and other road infrastructure. So I suggest that we can learn from motordom, which shifted the trajectory of history, um, and from Woodson, who also shifted the trajectory of history by recognizing the importance of history, by re-examining it, and by showing the alternative futures that these histories support. Yes? Uh, one more point, I'll put in a plug for uh, Canada here uh, <laughs> on this uh, issue. I think that Canada proves that the uh, uh, American motordom version of history uh, is not uh, inevitable and is not the only one and indeed is not factually accurate. During the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the standard rationale was that public transport was uh, uh, hopelessly uh, uh, obsolete and could not uh, work and uh, could not make cities, uh, even global cities, aspiring global cities, uh, uh, sort of meet their future uh, aspirations and, and destiny. And both Toronto and Montreal went in the opposite direction and showed that yes, you could build rapid transit uh, at a time when it was literally falling apart uh, south of the border uh, and make it work and that people would use it and that the cities would thrive uh, as a result of that. So most of the so-called analysis uh, that uh, was used to prove that uh, the uh, automobile was uh, the only way forward in the United States is completely uh, undermined by looking at what was going on during those decades in Canada. That's one of the reasons I moved to Canada to try and get to the bottom of it uh, even in the early 1980s, it occurred to me that, well, there must be something going on in Toronto if they're able to run a city with uh, effective uh, public transit when, no one seems, when it seems a proven impossibility uh, in the U.S. at that time. So we do have uh, something that uh, is uh, a, a, a lesson there that can be used to demonstrate uh, the alternative possibilities for mobility. Thank you. I will go to the question uh, dans, in the room, dans la salle. <laughs> Donc, vous pouvez poser votre question en français ou en anglais. Merci. So, I'm just going to put it in English. Um, I found it very interesting, actually, uh, Mr. Norton's um, uh, advert advertisement warning that the car sharing economy can have kind of a black side to it because uh, it's being sold to us today uh, as one of the good uh, solutions to uh, to to the transportation issues we have for from a climate change perspective. So, uh, but you are you are you're, you are saying that it might come on the other side and hit us back we, in the sense that having cars running around driverless actually can increase the number of cars overall and not really decrease them. Um, my question is really about. Um, what can, because autonomous cars are coming for sure, and the, the shared economy is also coming for for different reasons, but they go in the they converge. What what is in your perspective the one thing or a few things that we could do to make sure 
that it doesn't go out of control and, and, and it, it really becomes a truly shared and very optimized industry where you have like three people per car on average and not 0.8. Thank you. Thank you for your very important question. Um, I mean, first, of course you're right. There is a tremendous risk. Even if the cars are shared, there's still a tremendous risk because, of course, once being in the car and getting someplace no longer occupies all of your attention, and being in the car can be a chance for play, a chance for work, a chance to multitask safely, well, of course, this may make people feel quite comfortable doubling their commute distance. Um, I know a civil engineer in Northern Virginia who is actually openly gleeful about changing his current 50 mile commute to a 150 mile commute and he sees that as nothing but a win. Of course, if you think about millions of people across a whole country like the USA or Canada making such a transition, the implications are horrifying, I, I think most, many of us would agree. Uh, now, your question, though, is about how we can get this right. I would say the first thing we need to recognize is that these debates aren't simply debates uh, on a perfectly even, rational basis where the result will be the most reasonable position. These are debates where a lot is at stake for a lot of influential groups. So, for example, just as Listerine was able to create a market by propagating the notion that we can't know how bad our breath is and therefore we all have to, uh, as a precaution, cleanse our mouths of germs every single day or we risk being a social pariah. Well, those public relations techniques, while far from determining our behavior, do influence our behavior. And those public relations techniques will be influenced in part by the organizations with the resources necessary to, cam to conduct them. But we do have a wonderful advantage over the 20th century in that the public relations playing field has evened to some degree at least where it's now possible for organizations like for example street films, which some of you have heard of, where uh, people with limited means can get across a perspective that can reach millions of people. Casey Neistat in New York City gets millions of views publicizing the limitations of bike lanes in New York City, for example, and showing what, what their shortcomings are. Well, such public relations was essential to the power of motordom in the 20th century, and I think people who want to question the model we inherited from motordom need to learn from that example about how we, too, can apply public relations, public relations that can present visions of a future that we want, or visions of a future that we want to avoid, like Rachel Carson did with Silent Spring, or, at, and also, that can uncover the histories, which so far, the histories that have been told about the automobile in the USA have justified motordom's agenda, the prevailing histories, but we can get out the histories that also recognize that America has not actually been strictly a country with a love affair with the automobile. It's much more complex and much more interesting than that with a lot of other perspectives that have been omitted from the historical scholarship so far. The only thing worse uh, for uh, urban community than single occupant uh, vehicles is zero occupant uh, vehicles. And uh, if there's no uh, alternative uh, outcome than uh, the Cincinnati example that Professor Norton used about the 25 mile an hour speed. If that goes the same way uh, in this uh, next round with autonomous vehicles and we have zero occupant vehicles, cities will suffer greatly uh, from it. I don't know how much it costs to park in uh, downtown Montreal in the central business district for uh, eight hours during the workday, but what do you say, $20, $30? How much does it cost? $25. Why would anyone pay that when they could send their car empty back to Brossard or Hudson or whatever yeah. mm -hmm. and have it come back at 5 o'clock to yeah. pick them up uh, at That's the right. office? So Montreal will then be filled with zero occupant vehicles, twice as many trips uh, to avoid uh, paying for uh, parking in uh, the city centre if 
the uh, city doesn't ban it. This is public space originally, as Professor Norton said. The, the simple and essential uh, decision that has to be made at the outset is to ban zero occupant vehicles from urban space. It's just not on. And if they start, if you get them in, uh, as we've seen with other aspects of motordom, getting them out is a lot harder. So ban zero occupant vehicles from day one. Thank you. Uh, pour les prochains, j'aimerais que vous vous présentiez pour, avant de poser votre question. Uh, monsieur. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Chris. Uh, my question also relates somewhat to electric cars. Uh, should I be more complete with uh, what I like to eat for breakfast or something like that? Uh, I'm an engineer. I work in um, for a, a startup that makes transmissions. Um, um, my question is also somewhat relates to uh, electric cars. So. Um, if we separate two subjects for one second, one of them being the impact of cars on communities and on the way our cities are laid out, and uh, a separate subject being um, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels, um, insofar, it, insofar as we're separating those two subjects, can the electric car be perceived as a win um, for reducing the use of ca uh, carbon in general? Maybe it doesn't address the problems that the car or has on, on our communities, but it does partially address the problems we have with fossil fuels. So if we separate those two issues, do you see any pitfalls with electric cars, strictly speaking, addressing the, 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 the problem of uh, fossil fuels? Uh, it, uh, it all depends. That's what I teach my students uh, to say when uh, they're not sure what the answer uh, is. But uh, the reality uh, is that it depends what those electric cars are replacing. If they're replacing internal combustion fossil fuel powered cars one to one, then there are positive uh, options. If they're replacing public transport, even fossil fueled uh, public transport, the uh, implications are probably negative because a single uh, a motor bus uh, still carries more people for less energy uh, than uh, an electric car would. And uh, if they're replacing electric uh, rapid transit, which uh, at some peripheral areas they might be, then it's uh, also a problem. So it's in relation to what um, those, oh, and if they're just adding new trips on top of everything else, that's uh, not necessarily going to help either. Um, my suggestion, I've uh, written about it elsewhere, is that uh, shared electric mobility is a great first and last mile solution to connect into these electric uh, mobility backbones of rapid transit in our urban uh, areas. So um, there's lots of places uh, beyond uh, the island of Montreal or even in the sort of outer parts of the island of Montreal where the first and last miles uh, would work very well with uh, electric mobility if they take people to an electric rail uh, station where they can maximize the efficiency of getting to and from dense places like uh, the center of the city or the airport or other destinations. So if electric cars do increase, then the net benefit would be positive, do you think, for, for carbon? Again, it depends what, if they increase on top of everything else, no. Um, if we just add them as another layer, uh, as a plaything for the rich, uh, which is what uh, motor vehicles started out with uh, themselves, that didn't help uh, anyone particularly. So it all depends what they uh, are replacing and how they fit into a future system that needs to adapt and evolve. We, uh, of course, have to be sure that an electric car is actually, uh, when you measure all of the effects, cleaner than an internal combustion engine car, and I understand there's still some room for disagreement about that, but assuming that it is, I fear an effect that we've seen in other innovations. For example, it's pretty clear that the introduction of low tar cigarettes, low nicotine cigarettes, let people keep smoking much longer. They, not necessarily for good reason, but they sort of psychologically convinced themselves that it was okay to, uh, to keep smoking. And I wonder, just given the fact that an electric automobile can be just as spatially extravagant as an internal combustion engine automobile, if in fact we may not only have no benefit, but an, a net loss because of the illusion that we're helping diminishing our effort. 
this is just a, a caution. It's not, I'm not saying I know this, uh, but and, and basically I, I think Anthony has made the point very well that it may have a, a niche role connecting people to better services. Oui, donc les gens en, en ligne, je ne sais pas où vous êtes, mais on me demande de vous rappeler que vous avez le droit d'envoyer des questions et qu'elles vont atterrir ici. Donc voilà, vive la technologie. Euh, merci, merci, thank you. Prochain, euh, prochaine question. Uh, first of all, I want to thank both of you because um, I find that when we talk about energy issues, we often forget about the context and how we got here in the first place and we tend to lose uh, hindsight in having a systemic views of these and I think this is a big uh, shortcoming of trying to find the solutions. Uh, my point, uh, or my question, sorry, is more uh, towards um, uh, Mr. Pearl uh, because I was quite interested of the context you were bringing and how um, large-scale collective uh, transportation was developed, what were sort of some of the elements that uh, you found through your studies that were uh, sort of similar throughout all of the case studies you were looking. And so you were talking about, for instance, uh, key major international events like Expo 67 and so on that was providing incentive for uh, cities to demarc themselves. Um, and, and in the case of Vancouver more recently, the same thing. Uh, and, and you were saying that in the case of Montreal, there was a sort of an alpha <laughs> a state uh, that was there because we had a lot of headquarters of, of businesses and everything. So there was a lot of capital that was here available and, and so on to make uh, these types of decisions. But um, uh, as a Quebecer, um, historically, politically, in the 1960s, there was the Révolution Tranquille which was very important in terms of the decisions that were being made, not only for public transit, but we also had Hydro-Québec that was starting to be made. We had CEGEP, the reforms of the education system that were starting to be made. There were all kinds of systems uh, changed for the women's right, uh, putting a w aside the, uh, the religion from the government and so on. And so I'm just wondering because, you know, I find that it's great that we have events, specific events, like. Montreal is going to have the 375 <laughs> soon, and A, if it can bring more metros, good for us. But I'm just wondering to what extent does actually, you know, the, the particularity of conjectures in the 1960s in Quebec with uh, the leadership that was being brought through a social change, because there was a social perspective of how society could modernize, uh, become more connected, make sure, you know, there was a more collective, uh, you know, we have one of the only uh, uh, public state of, for electricity. H how was that also important in influencing how we developed our public and our, tr our transportation system back then? A uh, big question, but a very good one. Uh, there were huge tensions uh, about uh, the Quebec's place uh, in the world and Montreal's place uh, in Quebec and Montreal's place in the world uh, that were all swirling around in the 1960s. It was a fascinating time, I'm sure, to be in uh, policy or government or trying to do planning uh, at that time. And it uh, didn't all work out perfectly, uh, as you know. Uh, um, you know, uh, Montreal's place as the uh, alpha city in Canada didn't uh, uh, survive, uh, even though the infrastructure that was built uh, during that time and that legacy is an alpha city uh, mobility uh, infrastructure. And in fact, some of it, uh, the infamous uh, Mirabel uh, Airport, uh, uh, became a white elephant uh, uh, because it was built for a future that did not arrive. Um, you know, uh, the idea that uh, uh, Quebec uh, and Montreal would be this uh, uh, sort of Paris of North America, same scale, same size. I think part of that trade-off uh, and debate within um, Quebec during the time was between the sort of uh, capital uh, uh, hierarchies and uh, existing power, uh, economic power structures and the one, ones that you described, which were more uh, public uh, uh, equity oriented uh, and moving away some of the old elite uh, uh, structures. I think Montreal has come through that very well and still has this excellent uh, 
uh, major mobility uh, infrastructure as a legacy. And even though the legacy came from motivations that uh, turned out not to align completely with uh, the, uh, the future that was planned. And I'll just repeat my uh, one observation uh, that struck me was that uh, at a time when uh, people in uh, Montreal were uh, uh, disagreeing, sometimes quite violently, if you remember uh, the FLQ, um, about different things. The one thing that everyone could agree on was that urban expressways were not a good uh, idea. But yet they were built because they'd been signed on the dotted line uh, as part of the package for these global mega events. So that does suggest you have to be careful what you wish for when you uh, rub the genie of a global uh, mega event out of the bottle. Um, by the time it happened in Vancouver, there was an absolute uh, agreement that there would be no expressways built uh, in the city. Uh, so we were safe uh, from that. But unfortunately, uh, you weren't here. Eric Francoeur, de l'École des Technologies Supérieures. One comment rapidly on this whole highway. There's actually on the NFB website, there's a wonderful documentary that was made in 1955 about Mayor Drapeau's all plans for highways all over the place. And you see then in 1955 all these things coming together on, on, on paper. And, and uh, as you say, be careful what you wish for in some ways. And, and you learn there that in 1955, the big issue in Montreal, you know, was traffic, you know, and the solution was clear. It's just more highways. I mean, that's going to take care of traffic. It, the, it's clearly expressed in that way. So that's a, a great document. Uh, that said, I think you've re answered my, my question uh, a bit earlier, but uh, to come back to Phoenix, and you know, the Phoenix has risen in some ways. I mean, we've developed a, a world that's made for cars. I mean, uh, except a few exceptions, and we've maintained some of these in city centers. How do we get out of that? How, how do we, I mean, you've talked about the last mile, which is very interesting and maybe having but how do we get out of this world that we've actually, we've painted ourselves in a corner in, in a certain way? Is, are there options that, <laughs> that present themselves to us? Well, one way we can get out is if we actually pursue that strange utopia to its final conclusion, which would inevitably be so self-destructive that in effect, you have to get out. <laughs> but uh, if, if, uh, if the Rachel Carson of motordom that I've called for will speak up, well, I think she sets an example of how we get out. She had an eloquence that she brought to bear to the issue of pesticides such that she, while she was far from the first to caution about it, she was the most effective. Uh, in, in fact, I think that the best testimony of her eloquence is in the title she gave her book, Silent Spring, which is a three-syllable way of evoking that future in a very vivid and striking way. And I think we need to be warned about that future more forcefully. But, you know, there's also some practical things you can do, and those practical things can be made more possible by those sorts of warnings. The simplest thing we could do, and I, my talk was somewhat skeptical about high-tech solutions, but I didn't rule them out by any means, we can use technology better than ever to actually charge people for what they're using. And today, people use roads like the same way they would shop at, say, Walmart if they charged for their goods by the pound. They just would over-congregate at the high-value goods. That's what congestion is. And then the response, certainly in the USA, has been, well, to rush to keep restocking the shelves at the same lost prices. Well, it's elementary economics. It's what you would get in your first week of Econ 101, that if you don't charge people for the value of what they're using, they will waste it. And we, it's now, there was an excuse once that it was actually very hard to charge people for their use of the roads, you know, with tolling and so on. But now tolling is 
extremely easy with technology. Um, I think maybe the first thing we could do to make it more practical would be to stop calling it tolling. And uh, you've heard the terms road, road pricing. Uh, people are used to paying the price of the goods that is appropriate. Well, I think we can try to start to get people uh, accustomed to paying the, the cost of the roads that they use. Uh, and we are actually starting to see the beginnings of that, although it's clearly not gone nearly far enough. So that might help. And if I can just work in a, a, another suggestion, show people some visions, beautiful visions of the future. This is something we can learn from motordom. The, the Futurama exhibit at the New York World's Fair was jaw-droppingly awesome. It depicted a motordom utopia. It happened to be impossible to achieve, but it was very, very attractive. And I think we are still working at presenting visions of an attractive future that's not car-centric. And I think those visions exist in uh, Canadian cities, particularly in the places uh, where that uh, electric mobility backbone of rapid transit uh, exists, not just in the city centers, but also in some of the sub-centers where rapid transit has shown development uh, alternatives that are not based entirely around the car. So more than most places uh, in North America, although maybe less than in Europe or uh, Asia, uh, wealthy Asian countries like Japan or Hong Kong, certainly, um, we, we have, we're kind of a halfway house. I mean, whether it's uh, half empty or half full depends on your perspective. Um, but um, I know that uh, in the U.S., uh, Canada will confuse lots of people when people start bringing these items up because of the whole love affair uh, uh, imagery around the car and the sense that you know, I've been at places where people have said, well, you know, Europe, Asia, that's just totally irrelevant for North America. But Canada isn't uh, irrelevant for North America, and certainly not for Canada. The uh, uh, urban developments that we have can help inspire something uh, um, which might lead to the kind of rationality to raise resources from the less sustainable uh, parts of our mobility uh, system. It's a tough call. The BC election started today officially, unless I missed something. Um, and this weekend it was uh, a giveaway central for the two main uh, parties. Uh, the uh, current Liberal uh, Party uh, uh, that's in government uh, announced um, through this technology that's available for bridge pricing, they're building multi-billion dollar bridges that they were going to pay for entirely from user fees initially. Now they say, well, we're at, for our campaign, if we're re-elected, there'll be a $500 annual maximum on your electronic road pricing uh, on the bridge. <laughs> Not to, out, to be outdone, the uh, Social Democrats, the NDP, said no tolls. We're getting rid of all the tolls on the bridge. We're lucky in BC that we don't have three parties because the third one would have had to pay people <laughs> to drive across the bridge to bid up this uh, insanity. Thank you. I, uh, I work for a cargo ship company, and so I do a lot of traveling. And um, I'm just wondering if you see similarities with other modes of transport, because sometimes, for example, if I'm going to Quebec City, people will say, oh, are you going to fly? And I'm thinking, like, it's not that far. I can take the bus, I could take the train, it's convenient. It's, but it seems where I go, there's big investment in ports, there's airports always seem to be adding another terminal. I don't know if, is it something you've looked at, or is it a pattern you see, like a similar message being sold, that we need more planes, we need, uh, yeah. question for both of you. Most uh, people, if given uh, the choice, uh, would want to live uh, in a world where uh, they had unlimited travel options and uh, you know, infinite air miles to be able to go uh, wherever they want, and they respond accordingly when people uh, offer incentives, you know, air uh, uh, fare sales and that sort of thing. But most people also want to live uh, in a world where there's community and uh, local uh, uh, sort of space and place that is pleasant and uh, the Vienna type uh, uh, culture. Those are in tension uh, with each other, and uh, uh, very few uh, people can uh, get elected to positions of leadership uh, by um, promising uh, effectively uh, both of them, but that's 
what we've got uh, mostly is people who will uh, sort of equivocate and uh, offer both uh, unlimited mobility and great places uh, to, uh, to live without reminding people that there are trade-offs uh, in them. Um, the trick, I suppose, is to promise that and then find a way to um, harmonize the, the tensions uh, in them. And that's where the, the sort of positive, uh, if there is a positive imagery of Vienna surrounded by Phoenix uh, of the 1980s in Toronto. If, if Toronto can get back to where it was in the 1980s, where there is some balance in terms of uh, uh, mobility, congestion, pollution, quality of life between the Vienna and the Phoenix, they will have uh, made some progress uh, along the way. Uh, we're not going to get rid of either Vienna or Phoenix in our Canadian metropolitan areas. We're going to have to find a way to reconcile them on a trajectory that gets us to a um, more resilient uh, future, which, at least in my mind, will probably look more like Vienna than Phoenix, but it's probably not going to look exactly like either of them. I suggest that what you're referring to is the abnormalization of the normal, or the normalization of the abnormal, I, I mean to say. In other words, there's something a little strange about the fact that North Americans in both Canada and the USA routinely fly between cities that aren't very far apart. And uh, when you consider the costs in many terms of such short distance flying and the technologically quite feasible alternatives, it's a little weird. And the fact that your friends are asking if you're going to fly to Quebec suggests that that weirdness has been normalized. And I think we need to start re-abnormalizing the abnormal, if I may put it that way. Um, just, I, I think a useful illustration of this came out in headlines I saw this morning to the effect that the White House has proposed a, a U.S. budget such that Amtrak service, rail service, passenger rail service would end in more than 200 U.S. cities. At first I was shocked to know that there was rail service, passenger <laughs> rail service, in, in that many cities. But the, the, the second thought about this that crossed my mind was, uh, I believe I'm correct when I say that U.S. public expenditures on roads is on the order of 70 times greater than U.S. public investment in passenger rail. And what's quite striking about how this is justified, this difference, is that was actually in the headline itself. The headline said that uh, funding of Amtrak would be cut and of course, no one speaks about the funding of highways, it's investment in highways. And it is of course public money in both cases, taxpayer money in both cases. So the taxpayer money for roads is investment. The taxpayer money for rail is funding, almost with a suggestion of charity or something of the kind. And moreover, the cut to the Amtrak budget is represented as fiscally conservative when at the same time the budget for highways is growing, which means, of course, if we don't view of these things as totally distinct things, they're both transportation, of course, both surface transportation, what's really happening is not a budget a cut at all, but a redistribution of sources, uh, sorry, of funds, in such a way that we will actually move fewer people at greater financial expense and greater environmental cost um, than we will have done before and this is going to be misrepresentative, re misrepresented as conservative budgeting. Well, I think that's the sort of thing that ought to be fairly easy to ridicule. We're living in an era where we're seeing a, a, a wonderful wealth of skilled professional ridiculers who, are, who I think are actually sometimes really opening up uh, the, the minds of people to, in such a way that they start to recognize the abnormality of what has been normalized. And I think that gives me uh, some degree of hope. Thank you. I, I would say that one other weirdness that has been normalized is people taking car to travel 200 meters. But maybe we'll have time to talk about active modes. Next question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jerome Laviolette. I'm a student here at Polytechnique. Um, so I was going to ask a question about the future, but since everybody asks questions about the future, um, and you already gave some very good insights on how we can tackle uh, the car dependency issue. I'm going to ask a question about history. So, you're, uh, Professor Norton, you're calling for um, 
a Rachel Carson kind of messiah to save us from, <laughs> from the transportation problems of our times. But I'm going to ask you the question, wasn't Jane Jacob this kind of messiah 50 years ago, or almost 60 years ago? Thank you. What a wonderful question. And in a, in a longer version of this presentation, I would have mentioned Rachel Carson. It's very interesting, and, and you've, you've challenged me to, to rethink how, how I think about this, and I'll be interested to see how that evolves in response. But for now, let me say that Rachel Carson's book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, Jane Jacobs. I'm sorry, Ra Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, came out about a month, give or take a few days, before the NBC show of the week put on Merrily We Roll Along, a history of the automobile in the USA, which had as its thesis that all of the madness is perfectly understandable as the consequence of the love affair with the automobile and that in a free society of free people, we defer to that preference. So in other words, the, there is a, uh, a call for change and a response. Um, now the, the documentary I referred to, Merrily We Roll Along with the Love Affair with the Automobile Thesis, was in production long before Jane Jacobs' book came out. But Jane Jacobs' book was but one in a series of indictments of American car dependency that proliferated in the late 50s immediately following the 1956 Federal Aid Highway Act that gave us in the US the interstate highways. I'm speaking about people like William H. White, Lewis Mumford, John Keats. Um, they too, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, were all attacking this excess. And so the attacks have been constant. Uh, I guess one way of answering your question is that the Rachel Carsons that I've been expecting to uh, put it in, in, in the terms you suggest um, have been there. They've been there really since the 1920s. Um, I could give you lots of examples. Um, and, and maybe I've just dis disproved my own contention that a well-stated indictment here might uh, actually accomplish something uh, important the way it, uh, it did in Rachel Carson's case. The f I think the only fair answer to your question is we've, we've been having the Rachel Carson in indictments of automobility and of motordom for 80, 90 years, and we're still waiting for the one that will actually work. <laughs> okay, so any more questions? So I have another one, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so I will ask you both the questions. So we've been discussing, uh, of course, of, on how to do the transition, but I think there's uh, the one concept which is very important is the concept of risk when we talk about energy. So I would ask the question, so who bears the risk of Canada's oil vulnerability in transportation and why might greater awareness of such risks help to make more commitment in building these heavy rail or heavy transit uh, system based on electricity? Okay, my turn on that one. Well, uh, risk uh, uh, is something that is uh, unevenly distributed uh, across Canada. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think that those people who live in places outside of uh, these major uh, mobility um, backbones of uh, rapid transit are at greater risk. And the further away they are in the suburban, the exurban, and the remote and rural areas of Canada, the more risk that they uh, bear without even realizing it uh, of uh, a, uh, uh, an energy and climate uh, crisis uh, moving forward in the future. And it's always surprised me or, or I've always been puzzling about the idea that how can one sort of uh, help people who are at the greatest risk realize that you know the best strategy for them to maintain their auto-dependent, uh, if you live uh, in uh, um, Setil or something, you will be dependent on uh, carbon-based mobility for uh, quite some time uh, longer than here in Montreal. And uh, to be able to survive that transition, we need to make sure that people in those places have the access to the, those energy uh, uh, inputs that are essential to their mobility, both local and longer uh, distance uh, mobility. 
the best way, to my mind, to uh, provide that uh, assurance is to accelerate the transition toward post-carbon energy sources in the places where it is possible to uh, develop that infrastructure, which is um, starting with the big cities and then the next uh, uh, areas uh, around them uh, as well. I think that Canada's success as a nation has come from uh, periodic, uh, episodic, not continuous, uh, great political uh, leadership that has been able to uh, help people who don't agree with each other on many things to understand that there are advantages and benefits to cooperating and uh, having a shared sense of the future where they share the risks uh, going forward. And I think we're waiting in Canada for the kind of leader still. Um, maybe he or she is in the room or among us today, but it hasn't quite happened yet, who goes to those places like Setil and others and says, you know, the best investment for your energy security in the future is to double the amount of electric mobility in Montreal um, or Toronto or equivalent or Vancouver. Um, that's probably not going to happen in the current election in British Columbia from what I can see, but sooner or later we will have to uh, have political leadership that convinces people who are most at risk outside of our major urban areas that investing in the energy transition inside those urban areas is to their benefit even more than those who already live on the Plateau Mont-Royal who can walk and uh, have uh, uh, alternative uh, mobility options uh, much more easily. So to me, that is the political conundrum or uh, uh, challenge that faces Canada, but we've done it before. We've been able to get people who have different religious beliefs, different languages uh, that they uh, identify with to work together. So I don't think it's impossible for Canadians to come up with uh, a way for people often who are overrepresented politically in the system outside of the big cities to realize that it's a great investment for their future and reduces their um, future risk by putting in this uh, electric mobility infrastructure in the places where it will work early and uh, most effectively. I, I would only add very little, namely that in the U.S., uh, certainly, and probably in Canada too, the automobile was originally conceived of as a rural vehicle. And to me, the real problem was, uh, came with the attempt to make cities and towns into places where you could drive it anywhere and everywhere. I think we can afford to give rural areas uh, a little more time since, as Anthony suggests, these are places where uh, single occupancy vehicles always made a certain kind of sense despite their costs relative to the, uh, the extent to which they ever made any sense in cities. Donc on m'a dit que je prends une dernière question. Donc uh, monsieur. Um, uh, so I guess my question would be uh, about uh, public policy. Um, so if we assume for a second that you have a room full of uh, advocates that are going to walk out and write their MPs and, and uh, call their local representative to uh, make positive change in transportation, um, what sort of public policy initiatives uh, exist to, I guess, further the goal of, one, um, reducing the number of cars on the road insofar as communities are uh, more livable when there are less cars? and two, um, reducing the amount of carbon uh, that we use. So um, is it, uh, you know, pricing carbon? Is it uh, um, uh, pricing entering into cities? I think London has a, a surcharge when you enter in the city. Um, is it uh, tolls? Is it uh, subsidizing uh, electric uh, transportation? Um, so what kind of ideas would you suggest a room full of advocates uh, you know, sort of push for, um, if, uh, if we could. Uh, two words uh, uh, to sum it up for me, policy packages. Um, it's not possible, there's no magic bullet uh, that can solve it all, or no one thing that is guaranteed to be the beginning of the snowball that leaves, leads to the avalanche. If there was, I think we would have seen it happen uh, already. So, for example, you know, pricing roads, which I think makes a lot of sense, has to be linked 
uh, in people's minds to an alternative uh, set of mobility for those who are auto dependent. Otherwise, it's confiscatory. You know, people just think, oh, they're just trying to squeeze more money out of me because I don't have a choice anyway if you start pricing this bridge or this road or whatever uh, it is. The policy package solves that by saying, we will start today building this electric mobility uh, alternative, uh, uh, let's say rail or electric uh, rapid bus corridor, and we will finance it by adding road pricing once the alternative is in place, and then that will pay off the uh, borrowing that went into that. You could sell bonds tomorrow uh, in today's uh, financial market to pay for the electric mobility uh, extensions throughout uh, major metropolitan areas around Montreal. And the revenue stream to repay those bonds would not come from the fares, just uh, the fares that people pay. If you're lucky, those could cover the cost of running the uh, operation, but would then come from the uh, more rational pricing of road mobility once there is an alternative in place that people don't feel cornered and that this must be uh, stopped because it's just going to take money out of their already tight uh, finances. So poli that's just one example, but policy packaging to me will d solve some of these problems. You have to put more, it's tough to, for governments to do this, but you have to put more than one solution forward and put them in the right sequence so that people uh, see uh, a future that works. I think Anthony has answered the question very well. Um, I would just add besides road pricing, uh, which if it's appropriate shouldn't appear confiscatory if it's in fact shown to be covering the costs of the road. Um, I would also just add though that public health has been divorced from transportation and actually the two are closely intertwined. And if we can reconnect or connect public health policy and transportation policy, then uh, we can, um, uh, I, th I think, uh, help to move us beyond car dependency. Uh, we need to make problems like the time you spend in your car or the delay that you face in traffic no longer a public responsibility. This is not something that states have a business eliminating. We're in, our governments should not be in the business of determining uh, or, or removing all delay in your transit to work. These, uh, these are uh, things that um, have had self-destructive effects and I think um, we, can, we can do it much better than that. Donc, euh, je vais remercier mes, les conférenciers. I would like to thank you very much for your very relevant answers. Thank you very much. Alors, euh, ceci termine la, la première soirée de notre quatrième euh, symposium annuel Trottier sur l'ingénierie, l'énergie et la conception durable. Euh, ce symposium est possible grâce au soutien de la Fondation familiale Trottier. Et je voudrais souligner la présence de M. Lorne Trottier, de Mme Louise Roussel Trottier et de Mme Sylvie Trottier. Donc, au nom également de M. Soubassis Gauchal, professeur qui est le directeur euh, du euh, Trottier Institute for Sustainable and in the Sustainability in Engineering and Design de l'Université McGill, qui euh, alterne avec nous pour euh, l'organisation de ce symposium. Je voudrais vous remercier beaucoup pour votre présence. Je voudrais remercier encore une fois les, les deux conférenciers. Juste glisser que le défi est immense. Euh, L'an dernier, où, il y a un an et demi, nous avions euh, organisé un débat. Il y avait entre autres euh, M. Dion, qui était alors euh, euh, candidat, euh, M. Stéphane Dion. Et on demandait pourquoi est-ce qu'on parlait jamais, quand on parlait de lutte au changement climatique, de réduire le nombre de véhicules et de voitures personnelles sur les routes et il a dit euh, c'est quelque chose qui est impossible pour un politicien de faire. On ne peut pas enlever la voiture à qui que ce soit. Donc, euh, le défi reste important. Alors, merci beaucoup. J'espère vous revoir demain soir et bon retour.